COVID-19. Good morning. Can everyone hear me okay? Perfect. Thank you. And you see the screen? Yes. yes. Great. Thank you. So uh, I really appreciate the invitation. Uh, Francois, who is lead author, I know is uh, also here. I, I do want a little bit apologize. It's 6.30 in the morning here in California, and I have not had the opportunity to listen to all the talks. And so I'm, it's a little hard. I feel a little handicapped coming in here because I don't quite know where the conversation's been or the previous papers. So take that uh, as you will as I go forward. And um, yeah, maybe in the questions, uh, I can try to get some sense. So. This is a joint paper uh, with Francois, lead author, um, Julie Blackwood, Emery, Blackwood, Emery, Emily uh, Howerton, Katrina Shea, Charles Sims, and myself. The preprint is available. Um, and so let me just sort of start in. And I'm, I'm going to skip the first sort of introductory slide because I don't think I need to talk to this group uh, about this question about vaccine allocation. But maybe I'll start here thinking about, you know, what is our sort of contribution of this paper? And so, you know, we're starting out this question, limited supply of vaccines, how do we allocate it? And there's a number of papers that have looked at global allocation. There's a number of papers uh, that have looked at sort of within the geographical area. And our focus is really about how to divide up limited quantities across jurisdictions that might have very different demographic or epidemiological characteristics. And where we sort of started on this uh, research was uh, at the time, so this was back in September, 2020, the National Academies here in the United States came out with a report about how to think about this allocation question. And they came up with this uh, sort of what we're calling an ad hoc rule, which was basically that if the federal government was to allocate a COVID vaccine in the interest of speed and workability, that allocation should be conducted based on the jurisdiction's population size. Uh, WHO has now applied a similar, similar principle to its uh, COVAX program. And so we were really interested in understanding, okay, well, uh, we understand the intuition behind this ad hoc rule, but really what would we wanna do if we are able to sort of optimize uh, the allocation? And so, um, that's really where we started uh, this research was, you know, what are the additional benefits of allocating a vaccine based on an optimally derived allocation role relative to this ad hoc? Another way to say this was, is, you know, when was this simple ad hoc rule going to do well um, relative to sort of the optimal? And so um, we, so the ad hoc allocation is going to divide the limited supply equally between the jurisdictions. Um, and, you know, assuming that, you know, they're identical, we'll start with this idea, they're identical in terms of their sort of population size. And then, you know, the intuition here from an optimal control perspective is, you know, the ad hoc would be the optimal if there is no heterogeneity in the system um, at all, right? And so, therefore, you would be allocating uh, equally across jurisdictions. As we introduce heterogeneity, so differences across the, the sort of uh, jurisdictions, then that's where that ad hoc rule breaks down and is no longer sort of the optimal. So what are some of the mechanisms that could lead to this sort of heterogeneous disease burden? Well, it could be timing of the outbreak, uh, preventative measures, how they're being implemented could vary, so non-pharmaceuticals, non the degree degree of uh, compliance to these measures, different demographic characteristics, maybe more essential workers or a higher case fatality rate. All these things could push you away from uh, that ad hoc rule. And so we really wanted to sort of investigate that uh, in the paper. So what are uh, some of the key modeling determinants that we've done? So we have sort of a frequency dependent deterministic SEIR model or SIERS when we uh, include, um, you know, not permanent immunity. We have a two jurisdiction model uh, just to illustrate the intuition here. Um, there's no sort of uncertainty. So you're certain about infection status. 
individuals with uh, vaccine failure can be uh, revaccinated. Vaccine is going to block transmission, and there's no distinction between uh, vaccine-induced immunity or naturally acquired immunity, uh, and no births of susceptible uh, individuals. One of the things we're going to sort of vary in the analysis itself, so we're going to look at uh, permanent immunity versus temporary immunity, uh, so we utilize six months. We're going to look at the implications of travel restrictions between jurisdictions, and we're really looking at here uh, two sort of extreme cases, the sort of perfect compliance world where there's no cross-contamination across jurisdictions, and the other case of non-compliance uh, where there is uh, cross-contamination. And then we're going to look at different levels of vaccine capacity, uh, which is we're going to uh, model in terms of certain percentage of the population. And we vary that. And um, we're not going to consider that sort of, you know, the development of the vaccine. We're going to assume that the world, we're going to start the world essentially where the vaccine has been developed, uh, but there's a limited supply. Uh, available. So I'm sure this audience is very familiar with these models, but here's just a sort of schematic uh, of what we have the, of the model itself. Um, and again, uh, the preprint is available, which has a lot more detail than I'm going to go into uh, today. So let me talk you through, uh, you know, how we're doing some of the sort of um, the model. So we're going to be thinking about minimizing damages um, and control costs associated with the, uh, the disease and the vaccine allocation. And so uh, the damages in each jurisdiction are going to depend on the number of infected individuals I, um, and we're going to take into account the disability weight, which is based on sort of uh, lower respiratory um, function uh, and diseases uh, and the case fatality rate. And uh, C here is going to be based on the value of the statistical life. So that's our sort of linear damage function uh, associated with infection. Then we have uh, the treatment cost uh, function. So that's just going to be linear and proportional. Um, and it's our the control variable here is the number of vaccinated individuals in each uh, jurisdiction. What is uh, a little bit different is that we introduced this idea of a policy adjustment cost. So the National Academy of Sciences came up with this ad hoc rule for a reason, in the sense that maybe it's more politically easier to implement something like that than an optimal allocation where you could be giving one jurisdiction more vaccine than another. And so we, we thought about, well, what does that actually imply? Well, maybe there's some sort of adjustment cost associated with that ad hoc rule, that the further you move away from that ad hoc rule, the more you're going to incur this sort of political or social transaction costs. And so while, and the idea is that, you know, the National Academies, when they came out with that ad hoc rule, essentially they're saying if we're implementing this, this, it's assuming that this cost is essentially infinite, that you can't deviate from it. But in fact, you know, we're going to argue that it's probably finite this logistical and political factor cost. And so we want to incorporate it and then do some sensitivity analysis on the degree of it. And so what, how we incorporated this into our objective function is that um, we essentially have this sort of deviation cost. Um, and you know, this, I'm representing it here where the population sizes are equal across jurisdictions, but if they're not equal, we have weights in front of uh, the controls to sort of account for that. And the idea is that we're going to incur this uh, cost uh, if we move away from that ad hoc rule. And so, um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to solve for our optimal allocation conditional that this cost exists. So in theory, uh, we're sort of biasing our results to move us towards the ad hoc case because we're including this cost of deviating away. So anytime we find that in fact the ad hoc, the, optimal deviates from the ad hoc, it's in the presence of this cost. So that sort of gives you some sense of how you really want to move away, um, even if you're going to incur uh, this cost. And we vary this parameter uh, CA out front uh, 
to consider different magnitudes associated with it. And obviously, as that approaches infinity, you would uh, just do the ad hoc uh, rule. So we're going to be interested over a finite period of time, cap T, of minimizing the damages and costs by choosing the amount of vaccine to allocate uh, to each jurisdiction. So uh, one and two. I talked about the different damages and the, and the different costs. And of course, this is all subject uh, to the population or the epidemiological model. I'm not going to go over this, but I thought uh, this audience might be interested in sort of how we parameterize the base level. Um, it's conditional a little bit or, or not on whether there's compliance to the travel restrictions. That's what TR means. Um, we vary this uh, in the analysis. Uh, what else? Uh, when we include immunity, uh, that will come in uh, into play. Is there anything else I wanted to? And of course, we vary uh, the level of efficiency of the vaccine. We based it uh, on influenza vaccine. Most of this, the work and parameterization was done uh, in the summer of 2020. And we do consider different uh, efficacy uh, levels. So this is a pretty complicated model. There are 10 state variables and four control variables. So we don't get very far, obviously, in analytics. Uh, and so what we use is pseudo-spectral collocation uh, to solve for the uh, optimal solution. I, I've used this method in a lot of my work. I really like it. It's really, uh, some of the advantages are, well, one, it can handle large-scale problems like this. And two, it really builds in uh, the boundaries of the problem. And that is, you know, if you're operating uh, at the limits, um, it can build it directly into those constraints, into the optimal solution in a nice way. And, and I've had a lot of success uh, using it. So how we did this is we started a world where, um, you know, to get initial conditions, we basically said that there was one exposed individual in a population of 10 million and in jurisdiction two, the outbreak is going to start one week earlier, uh, and then we moved forward nine months in time uh, and generated uh, initial conditions for the SEIR model or SEIRS model uh, in, in that way. We're also not going to impose any sort of terminal constraints on our state variables, and so uh, those who know optimal control know that then there are transversality conditions, but allow essentially we allowed uh, those to be free and optimally chosen uh, by the solution. So let me sort of walk you through some of the high level results. So um, ad hoc allocation uh, versus the sort of optimal. So again, vaccines are allocated to jurisdictions based on the relative population size and the ad hoc allocation is going to guarantee sort of the equity of distribution. Relative to that, the optimal allocation is going to go where obviously the, the value uh, is greatest um, and you're going to deviate from that ad hoc rule and it's more closely aligned with what we're calling sort of the equity of outcomes. So ad hoc allocation is really equity of distribution, but the optimal allocation is thinking about uh, outcomes and the equity across uh, the systems. Another way to think about this is that the optimal allocation it's gonna make the current level of infection relative to the ad hoc more equal across the jurisdictions, but more unequal when it comes to the cumulative number of cases than the ad hoc, where the ad hoc is gonna, uh, the cumulative number of cases will be similar across the jurisdictions. So um, what do we sort of find? Well, the optimal allocation of the vaccine is gonna favor the largest population of susceptible individuals. This is a result that was already in the literature, not obviously for COVID, but uh, in other cases. Um, and that's gonna be an unequal distribution from a resource allocation perspective. We didn't find this high level result changed whether we had compliance to the travel restrictions or not, whether immunity was permanent or temporary, or if we increase the, the supply of vaccines that result uh, pretty much held. In terms of travel restrictions, so the way we did this was, you know, we had this two jurisdiction model, we had the mixing rate uh, uh, within uh, the jurisdiction, and then we allowed uh, some mixing to occur across jurisdictions. And so when you had perfect compliance, there was no mixing across, we just set that parameter equal to zero. 
And when there was non-compliance, there was mixing uh, that occurred. And you know, this also result uh, was in the liter has been in the literature, I think, uh, since we sort of published uh, our preprint. But the idea that travel restrictions and compliance to these non-pharmaceutical interventions affect the optimal allocation of vaccine, uh, like I said, has been out there in the literature, and we found that also. Um, and essentially, the way to think about this is that, again, go back to the intuition about what you'd want to do from an optimal control perspective, right? An optimal control uh, is really going to highlight and hit on the heterogeneity in the system. If there's no heterogeneity, you're going to do the same thing everywhere. With heterogeneity, you're going to deviate from that. And what does non-compliance do? Well, non-compliance to travel restrictions in our model is increasing the mixing of the two populations. So essentially, it's removing some of the structural heterogeneity that would have existed, right? So we had structural heterogeneity in that we had... Uh, state two had lower levels of infection at the beginning of our uh, simulation when the vaccine arrived than state level one. But as we mix so much, that's sort of gonna reduce that heterogeneity, which is gonna push you uh, closer uh, towards the ad hoc allocation. Again, uh, we looked at whether or not that general high level result changed with immunity, it didn't, uh, or the supply of vaccines. And I think, Here's I'll sort of illustrate graphically that result. And let me just sort of walk you through the, what's here in front of you, there's a lot. So on the top two panels, we have the proportion of treated on the y-axis. On the bottom two panels, we have the proportion of the infected uh, population. Blue is gonna be state one, red is gonna be state two. Uh, and then the, and the solid line is the optimal solution and uh, the dotted line is the ad hoc. And so we're assuming the populations are equal, the same proportion are treated in both places. Um, and you can see how uh, we have, and then, sorry, I should have said this, the compliance to travel restrictions is in the first column and non-compliance. And so when there is no mixing of the populations, uh, we're oscillating back and forth across starting out uh, with state two, which is the lower level of disease burden at the initial point. So we're, we're putting more vaccine in the area that has a higher proportion of susceptibles. Uh, with compliance, you can see that sort of oscillation dissipates. The bottom panels just show you the different trajectories in terms of the proportion of infected uh, between the ad hoc and, and the optimal. And the y-axis here is time uh, in months. So we, we did the effect of immunity length, uh, which unfortunately at the time we were hoping we would, wouldn't be a realistic case, but it seems like it's more and more realistic. Uh, and we looked at this, the effect of a six month versus permanent immunity. And again, it differs whether or not there's compliance to the travel restrictions. With compliance, temporary immunity increases the oscillation of the optimal allocation, basically because you're losing uh, your protection, it's going to force the optimal allocation to go back and forth more. Um, oh, let me just go back. Sorry. Uh, so again, I just want to reiterate that this optimal solution includes the cost of deviating from the ad hoc. And so it's incurring a cost to move away from that dashed line. And you're still moving away uh, in the, to sort of reduce um, the damages plus control costs uh, in the system. Okay, so with compliance, temporary immunity increases oscillation. With non-compliance, uh, it reduces again, and the, this result doesn't really change with the supply of vaccines. And uh, these are the graphs um, there. So the six-month immunity is over here. This is the permanent immunity case, and you can see you're going back and forth uh, more across the system. Let me skip through that. We looked at vaccine supply on the allocation itself. So if you had more vaccine available, does it change um, how you would do it? And uh, what we find is more of the vaccine supply will be given to the more infected state at the beginning of the time horizon. Um, and it can actually switch uh, your result, uh, sort of flip the result a little bit. So here's just sort of a graph 
uh, where the first column here is 5%, second is 10% uh, vaccine capacity. And these are the results I've been showing you at 10%. And then you can look at if you had 15%. I know I'm going through fast uh, through some of this, but like I said, uh, you can always look at the preprint to get uh, more discussion of the results. Then we looked at things, okay, what happens uh, if now we introduce additional heterogeneity? So here we looked at if one area, uh, state one here, the blue, had a higher case fatality rate than state two. And essentially what you would do then is the initial allocation of vaccine uh, would be uh, staying at, essentially all of it would be going to the state one, the one with a higher case fatality rate, right? And so this could be if one state, for example, had uh, more uh, elderly population, different demographics. And again, you can see how the disease dynamics varied, or at least the proportion of infected vary between the ad hoc rule in this case uh, and the optimal here by just comparing the solid lines with the dashed. We also looked at heterogeneous contact rate. So now state two had a higher contact rate than state one. So this could be, for example, if you uh, had more essential workers in that jurisdiction, uh, how would that affect uh, the allocation? And you would be pushing the allocation into that area with higher uh, essential workers. And again, both of these last results uh, are also in the literature. Then, um, we did an additional set of analysis, and this is what I wanted to make sure I had time to cover, is we said, okay, you know, a lot of the things that we're conditionally on in our parameters, we don't necessarily know, right? We don't know how much compliance there's going to be. We didn't know, uh, we still don't really know the duration of immunity. Um, and so we said, okay, what happens if you designed an optimal allocation conditional on a permanent immunity or compliance to travel restrictions, but the world was in fact that there was six months immunity and no compliance to travel restrictions. How well does that optimal rule do when it was based on incorrect assumptions relative to the ad hoc rule, right? Which is not subject to those uh, assumptions, right? You're just distributing it based on the relative population size. And so we tried to compare this and really think about the robustness of these optimal allocations relative to the world of ad hoc. Um, and the guy, as I said, the advantage here is that the ad hoc allocation is based on observable factors where the optimal, uh, we don't really know what the immunity is or uh, the degree of compliance necessarily with travel restrictions. And so this is what we, this part of the paper, you know, addresses this question. What happens if we design an optimal policy under a set of assumptions that turn out to be uh, incorrect? What are the economic and public health uh, consequences? Does this optimal allocation uh, still outport, outperform the ad hoc allocation? You know, in the case where you knew exactly what the world was, of course, the optimal is always going to outperform the ad hoc. Uh, but here, the, now, it's not necessarily the case because you're incorrect about the underlying assumptions in the model. So uh, we look at sort of, like I said, Im immunity length. So being wrong about immunity has a very minimal impact on both the economic and epilogical, epidemiological outcomes. That's good news. Travel restrictions, assuming non-compliance when in fact there's compliance, is going to to lead to greater cumulative cases, vice versa, assuming compliance when there's in fact non-compliance is going to lead to greater uh, expenditures. And then we looked at the combined effect, um, and in some instances being incorrect about immunity and compliance to travel restrictions can offset some of the, the deviations that we found uh, individually. Um, and the ad hoc, when there's compliance uh, to the travel restrictions, it performs worse than the optimal allocations, even when they were based on incorrect information. The non-compliance case to travel restrictions, it actually performs relatively well uh, than the world where the optimal allocation was based on compliance. And so in that case, again, the ad hoc is gonna do better in the world where there's non-compliance to travel restrictions because that non-compliance is gonna reduce the structural heterogeneity which is gonna be pushing the optimal allocation anyhow towards the, uh, the ad hoc allocation. So I'm not gonna go through these graphs, they're in the paper, but this is sort of really uh, illustrating uh, 
this robustness where we're looking at percentage change in expenditures versus percentage change in cumulative cases and seeing all those different cases. It's a little complicated to do in a minute, so I'll skip it and just get to the high level sort of discussion. So we show how vaccines should be allocated differently over time, depending on initial disease burden, immunity is permanent, temporary, whether it's compliance or not to the shelter in place order and the supply of vaccines. So uh, compared to the ad hoc allocation, optimal allocations will prioritize jurisdictions that are most vulnerable or further away from herd immunity. Um, and again, as I said, those, these results were already sort of put forth uh, in the literature be, uh, before COVID. So we're sort of just agreeing with that earlier literature. We show the value of complying to travel restrictions that it can lead to lower cumulative damages regardless of the case. Um, and that's essentially, uh, particularly for the jurisdictions with fewer infected individuals. We also uh, consider that the benefits of complying um, could be even greater. We didn't do this, but we could think about sort of nonlinear damages due to overload of healthcare systems or varying death rate due to scarce intensive care unit beds. Those are things we did not do uh, in this paper, but we could have included. Consumption losses aren't in here, right? We're just thinking about the damages uh, from the infections and, uh, and the allocation of the vaccine itself. Um, psychological distress, excess mortality are all things that you could think about and how they would just strengthen the case probably for uh, travel restrictions. And so um, I think this is my last slide. Yeah, so despite having to pay this transaction cost from deviating to ad hoc, we find that it is always optimal to deviate. Um, we could have considered other ad hoc allocation rules, right? We've just developed a sort of system and a structure to do so. Uh, but we just wanted to stay with the one that we thought um, just sort of highlighted the methods. And we focused on vaccine allocation, but there are very similar allocation questions coming about antiviral drugs that may arise. Um, and, you know, drugs and vaccines have different goals. They hit uh, the epidemiological dynamics in different places. And so it might be valuable to think about those allocation uh, questions within that context. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, 